Welcome to Buddha at the Gas Pump. My name is Rick Archer. Buddha at the Gas Pump is an ongoing series of conversations with spiritually awakening people and about spiritual topics, consciousness and the like. Um, we've done about 630 of them now. So if this is new to you and you'd like to check out previous ones, please go to batgap.com, B-A-T-G-A-P, and look under the past interviews menu. <clears throat> this program is made possible through the support of appreciative listeners and viewers. So if you appreciate it and would like to support it, uh, there's a PayPal button on every page of the website, and there's also a donation page that explains some alternatives to PayPal. So my guest today is Edward F. Kelly. Um, Edward is currently a professor in the Division of Perceptual Studies, DOPS is the acronym for that, at the University of Virginia, where Bruce Grayson and Jim Tucker also work. They, they're in the same department, I think, and um, I've interviewed both, both of them in the past year. Um, he received his PhD in psycholinguistics and cognitive science from Harvard in 1971 and spent the next 15 plus years working mainly in parapsychology, initially at J.B. Rhine's Institute for Parapsychology, then for 10 years through, through the Department of Electro Electrical Engineering at Duke, and finally through a private research institute in Chapel Hill. Between 1988 and 2002, he worked with a large neuroscience group at UNC Chapel Hill, mainly carrying out EEG and fMRI studies of human somatosensory cortical adaptation to natural tactile stimuli. He returned full-time to psychical research in 2002, serving as lead author of Irreducible Mind, 2007, Beyond Physicalism, 2015, and Consciousness Unbound, 2021 all published by Roman and Littlefield. He is now returning to his central long-term research interest, application of modern functional neuroimaging methods to intensive psychophysiological studies of psi, psychic phenomenon, and ASCs in exceptional subjects. And I might as well start by asking you what ASCs are, because I forget. Altered states of consciousness. Oh, altered states of consciousness, okay, mm -hmm. good. So um, that kind of, exp I, I, I said to you early before we started that I'd start by asking you to give the uh, elevator talk of, of what you're all about. Do you, did that little bio kind of cover it? Or is there something you want to add to that um, that's of importance to start out with, which we'll then unpack as we go along? Well, that, I mean, that kind of gets the gist of it. Um, yeah, let me just say that, um, I first got started in this direction as a graduate student uh, when I first encountered the scientific literature on parapsychology, uh, both the spontaneous cases and experimental studies. And I quickly realized that uh, something was going on here, if it's for real, that is not expected in light of our conventional ways of thinking about things. And to me, that made it interesting. You know, it says, hey, there's opportunity for growth here. And so that's why I started work right out of graduate school at the Ryan Parapsychology Lab in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, but like most people who come into the field from a scientific point of view, I really kind of hoped at the time that, you know, there'd be some little adjustment to be made in our worldview somewhere that would accommodate this stuff and it would all kind of, you know, fall naturally into place. And the uh, entire history of my career is becoming less and less confident of that. In fact, uh, I now think that uh, psi phenomena, I mean, they're certainly of interest in certain ways, but uh, I think their real importance is in pointing in the direction that we have to go theoretically. We need to overhaul our basic worldview uh, remaining in touch with science, but uh, where I think we're getting to is basically inverting it, like uh, Mark Gober in uh, his book. You know, it's everything's upside down. So I think uh, what I've gotten to over the last 50 years is essentially the opposite of where I started, which was conventional physicalism. Um, and I think uh, once you abandon that, and you have to, because of phenomena such as Psi phenomena. There is really no safe stopping place short of what amounts to its opposite 
some kind of an idealism in which mind and consciousness are what's really fundamental. And uh, anyway, so that's that's the long and short of it. Let me just uh, wave my books, if I may. Sure, yeah, wave them. I'll link to them also on your yeah, okay. get page. There's the first one, Irreducible Mind. That came out in 2007. The uh, subtitle is Toward a Psychology for the 21st Century. And in that one, we basically tried to assemble in one place a lot of the many kinds of evidence that are difficult or impossible to explain in conventional physicalist terms. Uh, we can go into this in more detail as we go along. Uh, then the next one was our first attempt to, to really seriously get beyond just showing that physicalism is not so hot and trying to figure out what might take its place. And this one is called Beyond Physicalism toward reconciliation of science and spirituality. And in that one, we uh, canvassed uh, almost a dozen uh, ancient and modern uh, philosophical or uh, systems or conceptual frameworks that take seriously the kinds of phenomena that we had assembled in Irreducible Mind and puts forth some kind of a conceptual framework that might help us to understand them better. And then the most recent one, which came out uh, last spring, is Consciousness Unbound, liberating mind from the tyranny of materialism. And see, now we're starting to feel pretty confident about it all. And we really wanted to stick a thumb in the eye of the physicalist opposition. That's the reason for that carefully considered subtitle. And in case people didn't notice when you held them up, these books would make good doorstops. They're, they're quite... Yeah, they're voluminous yeah. <laughs> uh, and when you say we in talking about them you're referring to a, a lot of collaborators who wrote various chapters right mm -hmm. yeah this uh, this began as a uh, project initiated at Esalen by Mike Murphy co-founder of Esalen um, Mike I mean he's an extraordinary guy prodigious reader uh, he was well aware that if physicalism is correct, then there can't be any such thing as post-mortem survival. But he was also aware that people here and there around the planet are actually doing research that purports to be generating evidence supportive of that possibility. For example, the work that uh, my colleagues Jim Tucker and Bruce Grayson do at DOPS. Jim works on cases of the reincarnation type Bruce mainly on near-death experiences. We'll probably get back to the latter in particular a little bit later. I have a special interest there. Um, so uh, Mike uh, convened a working group to kind of uh, examine the evidence for survival. Uh, you know, he has a kind of think tank embedded within Esalen. It's called the Center for Theory and Research. And there he can pursue his many personal intellectual interests uh, with a special allowance that he gets for that purpose from Esalen. And he's convened hundreds of these things over the years. But uh, this one, it turns out, went on for about 20 years in the course of producing these books. And the story there uh, is basically, well, let, let me tell it if I may. Um, yeah, let, let's go down, get to basics here. Physicalism, what is that? Well, that's the name of a modern kind of ascetic philosophical descendant of the materialism of previous centuries. We're all familiar with this stuff. We grew up with it probably, uh, certainly when I was in uh, elementary and middle and high school and all that sort of thing, this is what we were fed every day and it was still going strong at the time I was in graduate school. It says basically that all facts are determined in the end by physical facts alone. And the reason for that is that reality consists at bottom of some kind of little elf uh, flying around in uh, fields of force in accordance with mathematical laws. And everything else has to be built out of that elementary stuff, whatever it is. You know, it used to be atoms and then subatomic particles. Um, I mean, one of the things we should note about this right away is that uh, the physics on which physicalism is based is that of the late 19th century. And it itself does not take into account the huge things that have happened. I mean, the, the foundations of physics have shifted dramatically over the past century in ways that impact this conversation. 
Nevertheless, uh, when I was in graduate school, this was what everybody assumed was the case. And that among all the things that have to get manufactured out of the basic stuff, there's uh, our minds and consciousness assumed to be manufactured by physiological processes going on in our brains. So the idea is that corresponding to uh, every uh, thought and so on, there's some kind of a pattern of electrical activity in your brain that uh, uh, either accompanies that or is identical with it or generates it or some, something of that sort. And there's you know, huge literature on these things. Uh, but to you know, get right down to the basics of the situation, uh, everybody agrees that there are normally strong correlations between physical events in brains and events in mind and consciousness. So, you know, if you get hit hard enough on the head or uh, ingest a uh, psychedelic or grow a certain kind of brain cancer or something, uh, mental things change. So the, the physical causation of the mental is certainly a fact. Well, what about the other? I mean, I decide to raise my hand and up it goes. Isn't that mental causation? Naively, that's what it seems to be. Well, the physical answer to that is that you simply misunderstood what's really happening because that idea or intention that you form to raise your hand is really nothing more than a pattern of physical activity in your brain. Physical causes physical, no problem. That's very glib, but it's very hard to disprove. What we really had to do at the beginning of this project was to try to assemble in one place a lot of evidence demonstrating the existence of things that people can do that cannot be explained by activity of the brain alone. Now, first and foremost on any list of that sort will be psychic phenomena. I mean, that's what makes them interesting in the first place, that it, they, they seem virtually by definition to be beyond explanation by conventional means. You know, a person is embedded in his world and yet information comes in or goes out into the environment across some kind of a barrier that if conventional ideas were correct, that just couldn't happen. So for example, on an ESP test, the target is maybe in the next room, might be 5,000 miles away, might be up at the moon even, uh, or it might uh, not even have been selected yet, might not get selected until tomorrow afternoon. And so there are what seem to be decisive physical barriers there that should prevent success. And yet people succeed in these tasks. And uh, let me just say, without going further into it, this is a big literature. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of pages of reports of spontaneous cases, reports of thousands of experiments carried out in conventional ways. And the collective impact of all that, in, in my estimation, is that you can just take it to the bank that these phenomena exist as facts of nature. And our science is going to have to expand somehow to let us understand them, explain how they can happen. Uh, Postmortem survival, let me just mention in passing, is a kind of a special subproblem within that general field. And there's a huge argument that's raised for uh, 150 years or so now as to whether there really is postmortem survival or whether all the apparent evidence for survival might be explained by uh, psi-like interactions among only living persons or between such persons in their environments. And that's a long story. We don't need to go into it because uh, the plain fact is that both horns of that dilemma are equally fatal to conventional physicalism. So we don't have to have an answer to, to that question, fortunately, because, I mean, it's remarkable there. You've got very well-informed, smart people on both sides of that issue. I personally lean towards survival at this point, partly because of uh, irreducible mind. And I'll try to get back to that in a moment. By postmortem post -mortem survival, you mean... Reincarnation, for instance, or um, perhaps uh, near-death experiences where 
a person is under deep anesthesia and yet they're watching the operating room from the ceiling or something and obviously that shouldn't be able to happen but there's a lot of evidence for that and uh, any other examples of post postmortem well survival? yeah um uh, postmortem survival basically means persistence for some unknown period of time of mind and consciousness and personality after the death of the, the body uh, other kinds of evidence include things like uh, crisis apparitions. You know, in the old days, uh, a guy would be over in India in the British Army, and his sister would uh, hear him come into the kitchen as she's doing something. She turns around and looks at him. He seems to be really there, full-fledged, solid, three-dimensional person uh, with a wound in his head. And then he disappears, maybe passing through the wall or something of that sort. And then two weeks later, you know, the uh, letter or telegram or something comes from India confirming the fact that he was killed in that way. Uh, then there's all the uh, literature of mediumship, uh, some of which I have to tell you is really quite hair raising. I mean, for example, William James, one of my uh, heroes in the world of psychology, American psychologist and philosopher, uh, encountered a woman named Mrs. Piper near the end of the 19th century. And she was one of the great classical mediums uh, who convinced James that she somehow had access to information about his family that she had no normal way of having acquired. And he, uh, I mean, he worked with her and people who worked with her for many years. And uh, his, in his last published report, he uh reiterated that mrs piper had convinced him beyond all doubt that you know, what we now call psi phenomena are possible she was what he called his one white crow if you have a proposition that all crows are black the existence of a single white crow is sufficient to refute that proposition and she played that role for him in regard to esp um but, you know, a lot of psychologists and neuroscientists and probably philosophers of mind even still uh, like to think that this parapsychology stuff is just one little sort of peculiar anomaly. Maybe we can just kind of put it in the corner, you know, isolate it, quarantine it, and everything else will be okay. Well, uh, the rest of irreducible mind went toward making clear that there are lots of other things that are uh, about equally troublesome for conventional physicalism. So for example, we've got uh, chapters on things like some of the special properties of human memory, a uh, big chapter by my wife, Emily, on extreme examples of psychophysical influence. These include things like stigmata, you know, where people who are intense, um, believers in Christianity are imagining the crucifixion and develop wounds corresponding to what they believe were the wounds actually inflicted on, on Jesus. Uh, they also include things like hypnotic blisters of a particular shape. You know, John A, for example, would touch a patient with a poker that was actually cold, but terminated in a star shape, uh, saying that, okay, I'm going to burn you now with this hot poker and touches the skin and lo and behold, a star shaped blister appeared. Now we know how a star shaped blister would appear if the poker were actually red hot, but not sort of going in the other direction. That is from having a, an image of a red hot poker that causes a correspondingly shaped blister to arise. And there are a bunch of other phenomena of that sort. Extreme resistance to uh, pain, for example, uh, surgeries conducted in India under hypnosis. Um, well, we can return to any of these that people want to hear more about. Yeah, some of these, as you're mentioning them, sound to me like things physicalists could dismiss as being physical, such as the poker thing, because, you know, you don't need to believe in, um, you know, transcendent consciousness or mind or anything. To, you could just think that, well, it's some kind of psychosomatic suggestion thing that that the brain does and causes that effect on the skin um but others you know that you've mentioned um couldn't be explained or away mm -hmm. so easily yeah yeah i mean we uh we sort of uh, 
line them up in order from the most general and potentially subject to that kind of explanation to ones that strain it increasingly as they become more specific and extreme in character. Yeah. And, uh, well, let me go back to the pain thing for a moment. Mm -hmm. Uh, Esdale reports of one patient. I inserted the knife at the corner of his mouth, drew it to his ear across to the eye, peeled back the skin. It goes on and on like this for a few revolting paragraphs and then ends with the comment that the patient occasionally made a slight moan. He was sur- doing some legitimate surgery. On yeah, an actual thing. surgery. Yeah. I see. Yeah. This is just pre-anesthesia. Right. And he did hundreds of these things. Yeah. Um, and, and we give uh, reasons why it's not plausible to believe that a conventional physicalist explanation for these things can work. Now, I, I saw an article not too long ago about a young girl who, for some reason, couldn't feel pain. She was mm. born without that capability, and they had to be very careful because she was always injuring herself because she didn't yeah. know she was injuring. So someone might argue that, well, maybe uh, if if there could be a permanent condition like that, there could also a temporary condition could also kick in for ordinary people. Well, I think it would be easily possible to uh, rule that out now. If okay. anyone were doing surgeries. I'm just playing devil's advocate a little bit. Yeah, no, that's <laughs> certainly fair. Yeah. Uh, it gets more complicated, by the way, when uh, the effect of a vivid imagination is not on one's own body, but somebody else's. Yeah, there you go. Uh, so there's a whole class of cases called maternal impression cases. And there's something on the order of 100 of these. Ian Stevenson documented a mob of them in uh, his book, Reincarnation and Biology. And these are mainly cases in which a pregnant woman uh, experiences some ghastly scenario, you know, that totally horrifies her. And then her child is born some months later with a corresponding uh, defect. Hmm. So seeing a, you know, a limb amputated or something of that sort. Um, and again, what it's, it's particularly interesting because a number of these were reported in the 19th century uh, when physicians, and neuroscientists believe that you know the fetus was sort of continuous with the mother but as it became clearer that the uh, fetus is somewhat independent of the mother the uh, frequency of these reports started to go down even though there are a few even in the well into the 20th century so this is an example of how uh, you know uh, what's uh, regarded as correct theoretically shapes what people are able to study and report in the scientific literature. Anyway, um, let's go on a bit further. Uh, next, next chapter was about out of body and near death experiences. And there, let me just say, probably adding to what you've already heard from, from Bruce or homing in on one aspect of that. Uh, to me, the most interesting class of cases is those of the type you mentioned, those occurring under extreme physiological conditions, such as deep general anesthesia and or cardiac arrest. And the reason is that in these cases, well, let me go back a step. There is a very strong consensus in contemporary neuroscience as to what the necessary conditions are for having any kind of a conscious experience. Uh, And they, in particular, involve having a brain that at the moment is capable of generating and coordinating uh, neuroelectric rhythms, you know, brain waves, as you've heard them, in the, say, 8 to 50 or 60 hertz range, coordinating those over large territories of the brain. Uh, But those conditions are specifically abolished both by general anesthesia and by cardiac arrest, especially in cardiac arrest, which is an absolutely brutal physiological event. You know, the EEG flatlines within 20 or 30 seconds, and not long after that, neurons become unable to fire, which is the ultimate physical basis for any kind of communication among uh, areas of the brain. And yet, people are not only having experiences, but having the most intense and transformative experiences of their lives. How do we know that? Because they report things that go on during the time of apparent unconsciousness. Uh, There are a number of cases of this sort. 
Um, you've probably heard about Eben Alexander. I've interviewed him. Uh, okay. Um, I've interviewed at least a dozen people who have had this kind of experience. Yeah. Yeah. Pam Reynolds, that's another good case of that sort. And Nina Murjani, mm -hmm, features too. of that sort. Um, and, and we needn't go into the uh, attempts of physicalists to evade the force of this argument, but it really holds together, in my opinion. I've seen nothing to contradict it. And what it shows is that uh, not only consciousness, but quite extreme forms of consciousness are possible under conditions where virtually all neuroscientists don't think anything of that sort could possibly happen. Um, yeah, in some ways, yeah, let me just add to this. Uh, I, I personally guess that this will become the area of psychical research that finally breaks down the resistance of the scientific establishment to the kind of picture that we're uh, putting forward here. Uh, the, the idea that consciousness can operate uh, separately from the brain. Um, and this is a big part of why I personally have been moved in the direction of accepting the reality of survival as well as psi phenomena. Uh, let's see. Well, let me go on. Um, we have additional chapters in Irreducible Mind. One is about uh, genius, creativity. And let me just say there that... Uh, I mean, creativity is a subject, of course, that has received a fair amount of attention from psychologists, not nearly as much as it should, in my opinion, uh, and not the kind of attention it really needs, but at least there has been some. And yet, uh, if you look around, you find cases, for example, of, of the sort of the Indian mathematician Ramanujan, the properties of which just totally beggar the conceptual apparatus available to psychology at present to try to understand. I mean, this guy was just off the charts, fantastic stuff going on with him all the time. Regrettably, his uh, mentor, uh, the British mathematician, um, can't think of his name at the moment, uh, was not at all interested in these things. He was the, uh, the master of proof, whereas uh, Ramanujan himself was the sort of master of creative discovery. And I, I just want to interject here that you mm -hmm. know he he lived a normal life and just was gifted with the, these capabilities. But there have been people who have had brain injuries, for instance, who suddenly acquired the ability to be a improvisational jazz pianist or something who, yeah. who had never studied piano. I mean, things like that happen. Right. Yeah, there are lots of those things. We touch upon some of these. Another interesting one is uh, Savant. Syndrome. Like Rain Man, that kind of thing? Yeah, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, let, me, let me just tell you about one that's, I mean, it's just startling. Um, Oliver Sacks, in his book, the, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, he talks about an occasion, he's got a chapter in that book called The Twins. These are uh, autistic savants, two kids, they were twins, who could not add and subtract single digit numbers reliably, okay? Uh, against that background, he's chatting with them one day, and he knocked a box of matches on the floor. And the two of them instantly said, uh, 111, 37, 37, 37. So at the moment, you know, he took the trouble to count the matches, and there were 111 of them. But it was only later on that he caught on to what the 37, 37, 37 was about, which was that they had factored that number into the product of two prime numbers, three and 37. And that led him to inquire as to their familiarity with prime numbers. And so he got a you know big book, a table of prime numbers, and he started this game with them where they, they would exchange prime numbers and they gave bigger and bigger ones. They quickly exhausted his book of numbers, which only went out to about 12 digits or something like that. And eventually these kids, these little kids who couldn't add and subtract single digit numbers were producing 20 digit prime numbers, you know, that we need supercomputers to calculate. <laughs> 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 so that's pretty astonishing. And more generally, I think what is totally unexplainable in conventional terms is the kind of speed, precision, vividness, 
of the kinds of experience that come commonly accompany high forms of genius. And there's a vast literature about these things, the, you know, the, the experiences that various acknowledged historical geniuses uh, had in the course of producing some of their great works of art or music or whatever. Now, in this area, a physicalist might say, okay, the, the brain has marvelous capabilities. Isn't that great? And, you know, maybe somehow these savants and, and so on, or people who've had certain brain injuries, those capabilities get unlocked for in some way we don't understand, but that doesn't imply any kind of transcendent consciousness or, you know, mind independent of the body. But I think you would probably say, you know, and I would too, that there's, um, that the brain is more of a filter of consciousness than a creator of it. And mm -hmm. that um, certain conditions can cause its filtering ability to diminish. And then all kinds of things can come through and, and begin to ex be experienced, which ordinarily can't be. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly the way we take it. Yeah. Um, and we also, point out that the the only semi-plausible physicalist explanation for some of this stuff uh, requires something that almost certainly does not happen. Uh, you know, there's a there's a lot of theory about the brain as a computer and that sort of thing. And and uh, um, the basic story is the only way you can get more logical depth and precision out of the brain is to use more of it for any particular task. Yeah. Uh, but we don't actually see that in cases where these sorts of things are going on. And there are also, uh, you know, well-known cases. So the idea is that for a savant, for example, he's using all of his brain to calculate prime numbers. Uh, but there are also uh, historical cases of geniuses who are also, you know, I mean, they're polymaths and perfectly fully functioning human beings in all other regard. You know, savants are... The, the attempt is to interpret them as people who, for some reason, have all of their brains sort of focused on just doing this one or two th things. Mm -hmm. But that won't work in this larger context. Okay. Anyway, leaving that aside, you're correct. In fact, uh, uh, yeah, let me just say one more thing by way of background. The, the sort of model for Irreducible Mind is a book that was published in 1903 by F.W.H. Myers, one of the founders of the Society for Psycho Research. It was called Human Personality and Its Survival of Bodily Death. And if he hadn't included that in, and its survival of bodily death, I think it would be more widely recognized as a great classic of psychology. I mean, this guy was a bona fide genius and this book is extraordinary. Um, um, I forgot why I brought that up at the moment. Myers, oh. you're. Oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, so what we were really doing was attempting to revisit Myers's theory of personality in the light of a subsequent century of research on a number of the topics that he himself had uh, studied and, and uh, examined in his book. So we used his procedure as kind of a model for the way we approach things. Now, the last chapter uh, in, well, the last uh, topically oriented or substantively oriented chapter is on mystical experience, which now we're getting close to the heart of that gap's interests. And let me just say for starters that if uh, creativity has been somewhat neglected by contemporary science, that neglect is a whole lot worse for the subject of mystical experience. And let me just add to the uh, NDE discussion parenthetically that to me, it seems clear that what's going on in, in these NDEs under extreme conditions is that people are having essentially mystical experiences, but under uh, suboptimal conditions where you almost have to die in order to have the experience. Clearly, we'd like to find better ways of uh, having lots more people have such experiences because they are, uh, Bruce, I'm sure, talked about the remarkable transformative impact that NDEs have on lots of people. And that's true of mystical experiences in general. And they have the same characteristic that uh, things go on that 
uh, are ineffable in the sense that people can't even describe exactly what happened because it was so enormous and complex in its way. And uh, of course, there, there's a huge literature on this stuff. It's been ignored by contemporary science basically because of its obvious association with religion. And many scientists are just, I don't know, the this, this subject is just so terrifying to them that they can't uh, they can't take mystical experiences seriously. I think it's a, a horrible gap in contemporary science. And if our, our work does nothing other than encourage more scientists to take the subject seriously, I think we'll have done something worthwhile. Um, and there's a lot of overlap, by the way, because uh, there's a lot in the literature of mysticism that people who are having the experiences start reporting all kinds of psi-like events going on either immediately after or during. Or, uh, I mean, I've known people, for example, I knew one guy, uh, met him when I was working at the Ryan Center many years ago. He had a uh, very uh, stereotypical kind of Kundalini experience, spontaneous thing in the shower one morning. And he said he'd always been a slow reader, but for the next six months, he could read books, sort of glancing down one page and then glancing up the other and taking the whole thing in. And then that gradually faded away. He's never had another experience since then, as far as I know, but it opened him up in a way to these higher possibilities. So um, now in the last chapter of Irreducible Mind, we took a first crack at trying to say, well, uh, what kind of alternative to physicalism might enable us to understand some of these things? And we sketched a kind of range of alternatives from a sort of improved version of dualism to some kind of idealistic philosophy. And the one that we uh, settled on, because it was very prominent in uh, at Esalen at that time, and we had a number of members in our group uh, who had deep interest in it, including, by the way, some uh, quantum physicists. And this was um, Alfred North Whitehead's metaphysics process philosophy. Um, so the last chapter of uh, Irreducible Mind basically canvases those, I think shows clearly that possibilities are on offer, uh, which can do better than uh, conventional physicalism at attempting to explain stuff and which are in fact more consistent than physicalism itself with real modern physics. Uh, and I believe we succeeded in that. Now, for me as a psychologist, the main impact of irreducible mind is to support Myers's, the Myers and James picture basically of mind as somehow different from brain. Uh, they clearly work together very closely under normal conditions, but the, the better way of explaining the correlations is, as you said a few moments ago, to think of it as a filter, that conditions in the brain permit expression of a mind and consciousness uh, which exists in some way separate from it. Um, now, I'm going to have to get ahead of myself a little bit here. Uh, the next book, Beyond Physicalism, took us a lot further in that direction. We, we canvassed a whole mob of additional conceptual frameworks or theories or mystically informed religious philosophies that similarly uh, set forth a, a conceptual framework that might allow us to understand things better and that took seriously the existence of various of the key phenomena. And the key phenomena, let's say, I think really are going forward, uh, psi phenomena, number one, genius, number two, and mystical experiences, number three. Those are the things we really want to understand. And clearly having real understanding of a sort that might enable uh, improved access to these things is something that would be very good for human beings individually and collectively. And I think we probably share the sense that a lot of the uh, horrible and rapidly worsening problems of our civilization and our planet are ultimately traceable to this kind of physicalist worldview that 
drives so much of contemporary society. Our, you know, consumer oriented, you know, exploitative economic system, all that kind of stuff. Um, but getting back to Myers and James, that picture you see removes what for me was the final logical obstacle to the possibility of postmortem survival. If it's true that mind and consciousness are products of brain activity, then there cannot be anything like postmortem survival, period. But if their picture is correct, that the correlations are accounted for by this working together under normal conditions, then the logical obstacle is removed and the survival needs to be evaluated in terms of the evidence for it. And I have to say again that there's a lot of evidence, some of it of very high quality. And nobody is really entitled to express a negative opinion about the subject who hasn't taken the trouble to study some of that evidence. Um, yeah, beyond physicalism, let me just mention, uh, we touched upon uh, some of the traditional uh, mystically informed religious philosophies, in particular Neoplatonism, which, you know, apart from its kind of bizarre cosmology and physics and all that, I think it's an extremely sophisticated psychological system and, and uh, philosophy, metaphysics. Uh, we have a chapter on Patanjali and yoga, and we have one on Abhinava Gupta and uh, Kashmiri Shaivism, which seems to many people to be the sort of highest development of the whole Indian philosophical tradition. And uh, we had uh, several chapters by physicists, including both a quantum theorist and a sort of cosmologist and string theory guy. And a guy who uh, takes a special interest in the uh, long interaction between Jung and Pauli. You know, Pauli was a Nobel Prize winning physicist, one of the early people in quantum theory and so on, uh, who also was a very uh, disturbed person who was a patient of one of uh, uh, Jung's followers. And uh, they had an enormous working interaction over decades, produced the voluminous correspondence. Anyway, this gentleman, Harold Ottmansbacher, who's also a theoretical physicist, takes special interest in that. He's got a chapter in our book. And we also touched upon a couple of other representatives of the modern Western tradition, including Leibniz and uh, Charles Saunders Peirce. Uh, and Whitehead again. And out of that, uh, in the last part of the book, that book, we try to kind of pull it all together. What is what does this all add up to? And, and basically, what I was trying to identify was a kind of uh, uh, central tendency of all of these theoretical frameworks, because we could see in general that they sort of heading in the same direction. And this really reverts, I should say, to uh, William James, who in his chapter on mysticism in the varieties of religious experience, you know, he says flat out that this is the chapter from which all others derive their light. And in that chapter, he asserts, not uncontroversially, that the general tendency of all of these things that he's talked about in the chapter is towards some kind of an idealistic metaphysics, one in which consciousness becomes the primary element constituent of reality. So in chapter 14 of Beyond Physicalism, um, I attempted to do this tracing the trajectory of William James. Um, William James, in 1897 gave the Ingersoll lecture at Harvard. And this is where he formally introduced the idea of the so-called filter or transmission theory. And he did it in pretty much the same kind of psychological terms that I used. But he also has a long footnote in which he says, well, you know, I've been speaking here from the conventional sort of dualistic standpoint in which there are minds and bodies. But I do begin to see possibilities for going beyond that to a, a, a more radical kind of metaphysics in which there is really just one underlying stuff of some sort. Well, the whole 
th this was in uh, 1902, I guess, when he gave those lectures. And the rest of his career, he died in 1910. The main parts of it are his late metaphysical work um, and a book called A Pluralistic Universe, in which, and it's that book that I particularly uh, keyed in on in this chapter in Beyond Physicalism, because there he uh, elaborated on uh, the model that he had used in varieties of religious experience. He says very clearly, by the way, in several places that he is using the psychological model of F.W.H. Myers to explain all these different religious phenomena. This is the best-selling psychology book of all time, but uh, hardly anybody even notices that anymore. The key thing for, for James about Myers' theory was that Myers specifically proposes that our everyday consciousness is not all the consciousness there is within us, that that consciousness is embedded within a larger consciousness, which has what he calls edits and operations of its own, that is higher capabilities. Uh, James used that to uh, explain the various phenomena in VRE. But in this later book, he carries it much further. And the idea is, well, Myers has generated empirical evidence supporting that possibility of higher and higher integrations of consciousness associated with a single organism. Um, and by the way, I uh, realize here that I left out one chapter in uh, Irreducible Mind, which is rather important. It's one on um, uh, secondary personalities and centers of consciousness, psychological automatisms. Uh, that was written by a guy named Adam Crabtree, who has a long history of involvement with that particular subject. He's a therapist who deals with multiple personality patients, that sort of thing. But there are a number of cases in that literature which show clearly and this is the main kind of evidence that James himself relied upon, along with mystical experience, that in, in some cases, there is not only the everyday personality A, but a hidden one or more hidden personalities, let's say just one, B, such that B is aware of most of what goes on in A, but not vice versa. And furthermore, B may be a lot more competent person than A. And they are they operate concurrently sometimes. That is, uh, B can report things that are going on in A. So all these things are extremely difficult to reconcile with a conventional brain theoretic approach to the mind or personality. And James is building on that picture in a pluralistic universe. He he reviews a number of cases like Fechner is uh, his favorite. Fechner is a uh, fantastic character in the history of the subject, um, mainly known now for inventing the field of psychophysics. But he was a physicist and a psychologist who had mystical experiences of his own that profoundly shaped his view of how reality must be put together. Anyway, James imagines a hierarchy of such integrations. Uh, but in contrast with the idealists of his day, he's, he's mainly talking in response to people like Bradley and Royce, his colleague Royce, and various other idealists of, that, of the late 19th century, early 20th, when it was the main philosophical position. It was about to be uh, pushed aside by physicalism, but at that time, it was, it was the reigning champion of uh, metaphysics. But there are things about it that James really doesn't like. He doesn't like there being a highest integration that knows everything. Uh, because if it knows and accounts for everything, then it's also responsible for evil. And he doesn't want that responsibility <laughs> for his idea of a God. So he wants it to be you know, way, way above us. But incomplete itself and having some kind of a growing edge or environment that can help deal with uh, that problem, among other things. And he wants it to be more like us so that we can have a kind of 
personal intimacy with it. Anyway, I, I commend that book to you. It's a wonderful book, uh, published the year before he died. Uh, so anyway, uh, using that book and bringing to bear all the various positions that we canvassed in Beyond Physicalism, we arrived at a pretty clear-cut central tendency, which uh, amounts to what is called evolutionary panentheism. Uh, now, for those who aren't familiar with this theological talk, and I certainly am not a professional theologian, but the basic idea is, uh, you know, traditional theology, as in the Abrahamic faith, you have a God who sort of uh, gets everything going, creates everything, and then stands apart from it, might intervene either uh, regularly or occasionally. Uh, pantheism, historically, was the main competitor in which God is identified with the world. Panentheism tries to have its intermediate between those two in the sense that, yes, uh, God, which it takes as some kind of super higher consciousness, is present in all things, uh, but there's something left over, more or less in the same relationship to um, manifest creation as we are in relation to our bodies. Um, so our agreement on this is certainly not unanimous, but it's definitely the kind of majority view among the members of the Sursam group. Sursam, that's for a survival seminar. That's the, the name of the group that Mike Murphy convened back in 1998. Um, and yeah, I should say that, I mean, these books are really the collective product of all the people who have been associated with that. I mean, I took the lead as a writer and editor and so on, but there have been, I, I never actually counted them, but something on the order of about 50 people from various disciplines, including, you know, psychology, neuroscience, philosophy of mind, um, psychiatry, uh, history of science, physics. So it's an extremely diverse group. And one of the kinds of problems that we had to overcome <laughs> going along is learning how to talk to each other because we inhabit such utterly different, divergent kind of conceptual worlds. But we, we succeeded to that, in that, I think, to a considerable degree. And these books really have you know, the, the they're not like typical ed edited books in which you, you know, they're uncoordinated statements from people who don't seem to have had anything to do with each other. So I'm proud of that. Um, now, the most recent book kind of continues the themes of both previous ones, uh, Consciousness Unbound. So it's got uh, empirical chapters, one on uh, rebirth cases by Jim Tucker, one on NDEs by Bruce. Uh, one by a guy named Bob Rosenberg on precognition, which is really a remarkable chapter, I must say. And then it's got uh, five additional either updates or whole new conceptual frameworks, some by uh, new new people in our cast of characters here. Uh, Max Velmans is a very well-known guy in the world of consciousness studies. A uh, guy I'm especially interested in, I must say, uh, Federico Fagin, you may have heard of him. I was just listening to him this morning. Ah, uh, how good. One of those Galileo Commission um, webinars yeah. that you were part of. Uh-huh, okay. Yeah, Federico, of course, is one of the uh, major pioneers of contemporary microelectronics, uh, starting back in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, but he also began having profound mystical experiences about 30 years ago. Uh, he was trained as a physicist, of course, and... Uh, believed it for most of his or the major part of his adult life but these experiences convinced him that physics itself needs to be kind of rebuilt from the ground up in a way that incorporates consciousness at a fundamental level so he's got a chapter in this book devoted to that and he's working now with a uh, an italian physicist a theoretical physicist named dariano uh developing the model uh well, they have, they're working on a joint model now, which combines Federico's ideas about the primacy of consciousness with Dariano's ideas about how you can derive both quantum theory and classical physics from even more fundamental informational type principles. Uh, this is uh, deep stuff, and I can't pretend to understand it very well, but uh, 
if they succeed, they will essentially drain physics of its traditional physical content in favor of a thoroughgoing idealism. I think that's the nature of the game, basically. And these guys, oh boy, they're two high powered dudes. So, uh, you know, keep an eye out on that front. Uh, th another uh, new person is, um, um, well, let me go back. Yeah, there's a, one of the things that we had noted in Irreducible Mind is that Myers's theory is very much structurally like the personality theory of Carl Jung, except for the fact that Jung's consciousness, uh, Jung's unconscious is relentlessly unconscious. Unlike Myers's, they, they play a similar role in the two theories. But whereas Myers, Myers's unconscious is actually a larger consciousness to which the everyday consciousness doesn't normally have access. For Jung, the unconscious really is dark and unconscious. So he talks about mystical experience as the, uh, you know, the uh, the regular consciousness being flooded with this dark stuff and dimming and all that. It's just a it's a totally inappropriate description of mystical experience. Whereas in Meyer's theory and the kind of theory that we elaborate in Beyond Physicalism, it's perfectly natural for consciousness to expand and become more intense in the ways that people who have these experiences say. Uh, so all that's good, I think, for our point of view. Anyway, so there's a chapter, another chapter in uh, uh, Consciousness Unbound, which uh, kind of bears down on that difference between Myers and and, and uh, Jung uh, and finds that Jung was actually in his latest work following his own near-death experience, moving very clearly in the direction of a Myers-James-like theory and and toward, in fact, this, this uh, guy actually, uh, Roderick Main is a very well-known Jung scholar um, explicitly argues that Jung was on the verge of embracing evolutionary panentheism as his kind of official final metaphysical position. So that's another contribution. Then there's a, a man named Bernardo Kastrup, who a uh, very interesting guy. He a uh, computer engineer by training, worked at CERN, a very high level guy. I've interviewed Bernardo a couple had mystical times. experiences of his own under different conditions, which again uh, have led him to kind of rethink things from the ground up. And he's, I mean, he's basically now doing this full time. He's abandoned his engineering career uh, and enormously productive guy. He's written a bunch of very interesting, good books about why idealism is preferable to physicalism, why physicalism is why materialism is baloney. I was one of the first <laughs> and uh, he writes very well. He's got a chapter in our book too. So um, anyway, so that's the kind of uh, basic story of what we have accomplished over the last 20 odd years. Uh, and I do see signs in the larger um, sort of academic world increasing dissatisfaction with physicalism. Uh, Harold Ottmansbacher, for example, and a uh, philosophical acquaintance of his go to lots of philosophy of mind meetings and they, they sense that in that world, uh, particularly in the younger members of the philosophy of mind community, people are really more interested now in finding alternatives to physicalism than in fighting battles about it. And even in uh, neuroscience, I mean, the, uh, the emergence of integrated information theory as championed by Christoph Koch. Christoph Koch, you know, was, uh, or Koch, I'm not sure how it's pronounced actually, uh, the main disciple of um, Francis Crick. Uh, in his books, promoting integrated information theory, uh, has come right out and adopted a, a somewhat limited panpsychism in which consciousness is fundamental. It's a property of the universe as fundamental as, you know, spin and charge and mass and stuff like that. 
So the change is really in the air, I think, for the first time in my career. I'm always a little guarded about these kind of things. You know, William James himself said back in 1890 something, uh, you know, the scientific world will have to take pay attention to these things. And, uh, you know, conversations about philosophy of mind can no longer be the same. And they stay the same for another <laughs> hundred years. <laughs> so it's a little hard to read these changes in the zeitgeist, you know, an inflection point in cultural history isn't as sharply defined as one in a mathematical function. And this inflection point has been spread out over decades. But I, I really do have the sense that the culture is changing. Something's in the wind that uh, more scientists, I think, are starting to take realize that they need to take seriously uh, some of these rogue phenomena that challenge the prevailing physicalist viewpoint. It has plenty of cultural defenders, however, and certainly the availability of a better worldview doesn't imply either that it will become generally accepted or that if accepted, it would be utilized in the, anything like an optimum way. So, Net sense is that um, good things are in the works, but there's a long road to travel still. Wow. Well, that was a great overview. That was probably the least amount that I've talked during at least the first hour of an interview <laughs> that I've ever done. But you were saying such great stuff, and I just didn't want to trip you up. You know, um, It was such a wonderful synopsis of, of all of your work, and it, it really... If anyone followed all that, they I think they would learn a lot and it would give them a lot of um, breadcrumbs to follow, you know, in order to mm, yeah. find out a heck of a lot more about these things. Yeah, the, the, the real basic thing here is that uh, for people who are interested in personal transformation, there is now a serious scientific foundation for what you're trying to do. And it's going to get stronger because, you know, meditation is now a subject of real interest. I mean, in, in its current form, it's it's really kind of peculiar the way it's evolved because meditation research has legitimized itself, you know, by coupling itself to uh, public health and thereby accessing the conventional funding mechanisms for research. But it is inevitable, in my opinion. I mean, a, a lot of the stuff that's been done, quite frankly, is pretty low level, uninteresting stuff, you know. Mike Murphy jokes about meditation for hemorrhoids and that sort of thing. <laughs> but it is inevitable, in my opinion, that we are going to come into contact with the deeper regions of the subject. And that's when things will really get interesting. There's already been some. I mean, you know, Richie Davidson and company uh, at Wisconsin doing neuroimaging studies with these super duper Buddhist meditators. I hope there will be a lot more work of that sort. And I think it's already shown things that are shocking to neuroscientists. So there's plenty to learn there. And it could be very practically useful to people who are, you know, get, getting interested in meditation and interested in self transformation. The other big area to watch, by the way, is psychedelic research. Psychedelic neuroimaging research is well underway. I mean, it's certainly still very early stage. But it's already shown things that have been totally shocking to neuroscientists. Uh, in particular, the very, not the very first, the, the, there were a bunch of studies, excuse me, back in the 90s uh, using psilocybin uh, given orally and using uh, PET positron emission tomography as the imaging technology. And that basically seemed to confirm what most people expected that is that, you know, if you're having these intense psychological states, there must be something unusually intense physiologically going on. And those studies seem to support that. There was a lot of activity, excess activity in a bunch of areas, including frontal cortical areas. However, in 2012, a study appeared by a group in uh, England that used injected psilocybin together with two kinds of functional magnetic resonance imagery uh, 
imaging, which has much better temporal and spatial resolution. And the results of that study just flabbergasted people because there were no increases in activity anywhere in the brain. Instead, you saw lots of decreases, especially in a very interesting component of the brain called the default mode network, which has come to be viewed as kind of the neural instantiation of your everyday self or ego. And basically in this study, and it's been confirmed by a number of subsequent studies, that system basically got taken apart. Activity was reduced coupling reduced among the major nodes of that system. And that, the amount of that kind of uh, effect correlated with the intensity of the experience. And that you see is, I mean, that's very consistent with the kind of picture we talked about earlier, where you do something, whatever it is, and there may be many ways to do these things. Some kind of conditions occur in the brain that allow these higher states to penetrate into everyday consciousness. Yeah, we can and learn lots more about those. The filtering idea, that, and, and what you're yeah. saying is that there was a, a reduction of activity in the default mode network, which means an attenuation of ego, perhaps, yeah. which all the spiritual traditions talk about, and, right. and that allowed, you know, a much greater expansion of consciousness than would otherwise have been taking yeah. place. Yeah. Great. So meditation and uh, psychedelic research, I think, is going to carry us in the direction of experimental study of meditative states and lead to, eventually, improved ways of inducing these kinds of states and yeah. stabilizing them. And of course, you know, such research has been going on for 50 years. And, you know, some of it is crap, like you said, but a lot of it is very significant. And, uh, you know, mm. more and more and more has been accumulating over these decades. Um, so there's obviously something going on. I mean, one thing that comes to mind as you speak of all this is that um, the only way a person could adamantly deny the kinds of things you're talking about is if they had simply not looked at the research you know yeah. that's the galileo commission is so named because galileo's contemporaries refused to look through his telescope you know because what he claimed he was seeing clashed with their religious worldview <laughs> and uh you know I, I was kind of also thinking of thomas kuhn's book as you were talking you know the mm -hmm. structure of scientific revolutions and i don't know if he said this because it was decades ago that i read it but it seems to me that the more fundamental a paradigm you know the more deep a paradigm or, or well entrenched the greater the anomalies it would take to um, shake it and eventually usurp yeah. it um, and you know what could be more fundamental than the i mean the, the the physicalism paradigm is very fundamental in our culture and yeah. has been for a long time so um it, by rights it should have already you know been seriously shaken if not overturned given all the, the evidence that you just outlined but um it hasn't been uh, maybe it's shaking though as you just said you know and like he, young, i think it was max planck who said that science progresses through a f series of funerals and so it was encouraging mm -hmm. that you said that a lot of younger people are not buying into that physicalist par paradigm anymore and mm -hmm. are open to exploring these things and you know perhaps even within our lifetimes it'll flip for the Maybe. most part yeah i certainly hope so i think i mean i think we're in a race against time basically to change our worldview and change our ways of doing things culturally or we're going to destroy ourselves yeah now that might not be obvious to people i i feel very strongly that also i mean we have so many problems in the world we hear about them in the news and you know climate change and and so many other things there are any number of things which could do us in and uh, i don't think most people have ever pondered the connection between those and the kinds of things you've been discussing and they might mm -hmm. consider it a bit of a stretch to suggest that well if we kind of begin to explore consciousness then somehow the climate situation will be resolved or the, all these other problems how would you explain the causal connection there if there is one yeah i hesitate to get into this area because i'm certainly no cultural historian or anything like that there are there are a bunch of books out there that explore these themes though 
what I should do, maybe I've, I've got a list of them somewhere. I, I could try to send you that. Uh, but I mean, to take one, one example, and it's kind of fundamental to the spiritual traditions, you know, if, um, if physicalism is true and we we're encased in our skulls and there's no other connection among us than what we can affect, you know, in ordinary conversation and physical interactions and so on, then, you know, it's, it's hard to establish a kind of community oriented ethics or ethos. But if the alternative spiritual view of things is correct, and that we are all ultimately connected at this most fundamental level of a great consciousness from which we all emerge, then in harming you, I'm harming myself. You know, the, the golden rule emerges naturally from, from that kind of a cosmology. So imagine if it can be scientifically established. I think we're really quite close to doing that, that that is a better picture of how things really are. Then would we treat each other better with that knowledge and want to treat the planet better, knowing that we're, you know, it's just we're all passengers on this thing and it's a, you know, we know a lot more about it now from the vantage point of space. And maybe those that, that that kind of an ethos can really take hold and become effective in people's lives. Yeah. Another way of thinking about it is if, um, we, you know, I'm, it, we could consider pretty much everything that we see in the world as a creation or reflection or manifestation of human influence and and you know human effort and it might it's it's fair to say i think that the quality of the world politics economics environment you know health so many different things is a simple reflection of the predominant mindset of humanity mm -hmm. you know which in yeah. itself is a is a, a collection of all the individual mindsets of humanity you know like simple analogy if if a forest looks like it's pretty much gray and dead it's because every individual tree is mm -hmm. and you know you can't really make the forest healthy without um, somehow making each individual tree healthy and then when you do that then overall the forest will begin to appear healthy so somehow or other um we you know enough individual human beings how if they if their consciousness begins to awaken or enliven there will be a, a more collective awakening and not just because of the sort of individual numbers showing up as the case would be with trees but i think because there's a and i've heard you talk about this or one of your <clears throat> writers talk about this in, in one of your books that there's the deeper you go the more collective consciousness becomes um so you know we uh like just with as with waves you know, you go down to the root of the wave and oh it's all one ocean all the individual waves are <clears throat> expressions of it so you know i think that there's something to the the idea that as individual consciousness develops that doesn't just benefit the individuals but it enriches mm -hmm. the the whole field or to use the forest yeah. analogy it makes the ground of the forest more you know fertile for all the trees that's certainly the hope yeah yeah, I'm, uh, you know, limited by background and temperament to uh, doing the kind of stuff that I, I do, but I feel that there's a lot there and would really like to somehow energize further work along those lines to draw out these kinds of connections and make them palpable and, and convincing to people. Yeah. Um... All right, let me ask you a couple of questions that have come in from guests. First, here's one from my good friend, Curtis Mayu. Um, he lives in Virginia also, but I think he's in the DC area. How do we distinguish between ineffable experiences when they are described afterward? The language used to describe them is too imprecise to distinguish between a meditation-induced feeling of oneness, wholeness, versus a psychedelic experience that might be described using the same words. Well, these are good and difficult questions. Um, I'm not sure how best to answer them, but uh, a guy who is particularly important in this connection is Roland Griffiths oh, yeah. at Johns Hopkins University. Uh, he has just managed to create a whole 
new Center for Psychedelic Research. I forget the exact title of it, but you can easily find it. Uh, he did, uh, in about 2006, published a replication of what was called the Good Friday Experiment back in the 60s. Uh, and I think uh, already established, uh, even for people who were skeptical of it previously, that under appropriate conditions, real mystical experiences can be had uh, using psychedelics that are indistinguishable phenomenologically from spontaneous mystical experiences. There's a lot of literature about this, particularly uh, back in the you know 60s and 70s in the, uh, during that time of ferment when Tim Leary was ascendant and uh, giving psychedelics a bad reputation and basically stimulating some bad legislation that prevented further research on the stuff. Um, there were a number of people, particularly from the side of religious studies, who took exception to the idea that you could have a real mess, mystical experience by swallowing a pill or something of that sort. Uh, Zaner in particular was one of those. But I think we're to the point now where, well, it's probably true that most psychedelic experiences aren't very profound at all. They're more superficial sensory and cognitive kinds of stuff. Under the right conditions, real mystical experiences can definitely occur. Now, the other thing I wanted to say immediately in response, and I'm sure I'm not covering all dimensions of this question. You know, the, uh, the, the literature of what's called apophatic mysticism, the negative way, uh, talks about mystical experiences being empty of ordinary kinds of cognition and thinking and so on, verbal stuff and all that. And in fact, a lot of uh, um, training for mystical experience involves attempting to eliminate that kind of stuff from what's going on in your experience. But what results when you're successful in, quote, emptying your mind is not emptiness because these deep mystical experiences, even the introvertive type in which there's no contact of any kind with the world outside, but just a one-pointed introvertive consciousness. It's not empty, but strangely full, a vacuum and a plenum. Uh, and the guy who was, I think, especially good about that was Walter Stace back in 1960. He published his book, Mysticism and Philosophy. He took a lot of abuse subsequently from the uh, community of scholars of religion, notably uh, Katz, Stephen Katz, who have emphasized differences among traditions in terms of their teachings and so on, and probably their mystical experiences as well. Um, but even though people aren't able to describe later on exactly what it was that happened, they can kind of point to it, you know, by saying, and many of these people, you know, they say, I, I can't possibly describe what happened to me, but then they, you know, write a huge book or a series of books, Jacob Bame being a <laughs> prime example <laughs> who wrote, I don't know how many books describing his experience. Um, and we know a good bit about them, that they, they're, they're, there's a family of related experiences. Stace was particularly interested in this introvertive type because he thought he could argue from that to the basic picture, basic, you know, Brahman and Atman picture, that uh, there has to be ultimately only one consciousness, empty consciousness, uh, because, you know, it's because the argument from indiscernibles, if there's nothing that can distinguish two experiences, then they're the same experience. And therefore all experiences of introvertive uh, consciousness were experiences of a single great consciousness. That's a breathtaking argument that probably can't quite hold together, but it may be the truth of the matter. But the other big class that has been studied less is the extrovertive type in which a world is still present, but infused, you know, by, this is the cosmic consciousness kind of experience described by people like um, Buck, Richard Maurice Buck, and uh, Edward Carpenter, 
Plotinus, well, Plotinus is more of an introverted uh, mystic. Uh, and, oh, by the way, yeah, I wanted to mention my co-editor, Paul Marshall. He, well, you'll be interested in this. Paul Marshall is uh, another example of an interesting fact about our SIRSAM group. I mean, we've had maybe 50 people in this group. There are at least eight or 10 of them whose entire careers have been shaped by mystical experiences of their own, either from early childhood or more recently. And uh, the probability of that happening by chance is essentially zero. Uh, so that's another uh, good example of uh, how these things impact people and shape their lives. Anyway, Paul is uh, another example. He was a, uh, a physics student at Cambridge who had a, a couple of mystical experiences, one of which in particular really impressed him. And he, I would say, has spent the rest of his life so far, and he's a relatively young guy trying to figure out what happened to him. One other thing I should say in this context, I'm part of a group now that's uh, intensively studying a book by a man named Tim Eastman. This book is called Untying the Gordian Knot. Tim Eastman is a, uh, he's actually a plasma physicist, of course, mainly on uh, space and that sort of stuff in his scientific career. But he starts this book by describing a mystical experience that he had as a young kid living on a farm in northern Minnesota on a piece of land adjacent to what used to be Lakota Indian territory. And this thing happened to him. He was blown away by it at the time. And I think it's fair to say that he spent the rest of his life when not in his day job trying to figure out what happened. So this book is an attempt to address that question. He is sort of uh, approaching the same kinds of phenomena that we cataloged in Irreducible Mind. He takes psi phenomena seriously, has had a couple of experiences of his own of that sort, takes mystical experiences uh, very seriously. And uh, when he talks about creativity, he even uh, pulled out the same example that we did in, in our chapter on that, namely Ramanujan, the Indian mathematician, who without any formal training recapitulated the entire history of Western math and carried it uh, about a century forward in some areas. Now, but the way he goes about it is, wow, ever so different from the way we did uh, because of his background, which is all, you know, physics and math and logic and so on. And it turns out I had no inkling of any of this stuff, well, a little bit of, on the physics side, but he sort of pulls together a whole bunch of developments in those areas to argue that we must revise our concept of reality uh, in several ways, but in particular by acknowledging that there is a whole dimension of reality normally hidden to us which corresponds to what Heisenberg described as potentia or potentiae, a world of possible things that interacts with the actual world in ways that he tries to elaborate and causes the things that do happen to happen. So now his way and our way of approaching the subjects are very different, but what I'm Working with him now to try and flesh out more is ways of building bridges between that opening that he creates through this very technical kind of background and our way of approaching it through successively more integrated states of consciousness. That was kind of a lengthy uh, answer. No, that was great. You, um, I just wanted to comment on the emptiness, fullness thing, uh, mm -hmm. a few other points you made. Um, inner mystical experience might be could be regarded as empty because it's devoid of the concrete objects of perception that we usually have yeah. uh, but when you're having such an experience there it definitely doesn't feel empty there's a fullness of bliss yeah. of um, there's an expansion or a, a sense of omnipresence there's um, sometimes a feeling of knowingness or all knowingness mm -hmm. and so on and um and then what the next thing you said about that external um orient you know version of that yeah. is uh i think perhaps usually um subsequent to having had enough clear deep 
um, internal experiences such as I just described. And what those do to you is eventually um, infuse into your whole mind-body system such that you begin to see the essential nature of everything all around you as you mm-hmm. as you interact with it and perceive it so you know then that's where the quality of unity can come in because you can be looking at something and in seeing its essential nature which is identical to your own essential nature which you've already explored you find that you and the thing are one mm-hmm. there's a there's a, an experience of unity um I don't want to be too personal about it, but are you speaking from personal experience here or from reading the literature? Uh, well, I've been meditating for 54 years, a um, couple hours a day. And so a lot of it is uh, from derived from my personal experience. And mm-hmm. But I don't consider that to be complete by any means. It's an ongoing, you know, I'm a work in progress. But I've had, you know, either a pretty clear tastes of the things I'm saying. Mm-hmm. I envy you. I, I envy all of my colleagues who have had these kinds of experiences. <laughs> yeah. William um, James, you know, talked about having a, a mystical germ, but no real experiences of his own. The closest he got was with uh, nitrous oxide. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, this is better than nitrous oxide, I'm sure. <laughs> um, although laughter can accompany it. Um, but um, then this other thing you said, I, I, I forget whether this was from Eastman or not. But um, and, and it ties into Kashmir Shaivism also is that this sort of un, this foundational level of creation or reality or consciousness or whatever we want to call it is definitely not an emptiness because it contains within it the potentialities for the whole universe to, yeah. to manifest. And so it's, it could really rather be thought of as a field of all possibilities, as a phrase that Deepak likes to use, or, you mm-hmm. know, just a sort of a plenum of. Uh, energy, intelligence, creativity, which mm-hmm. bursts forth as as the tremendous variety and complexity of creation. Yeah. Mike Murphy uh, jokes about how the uh, you know the the Ramakrishna Vedanta school uh-huh. is the up and out school. You know that kind of takes the view that the world we live in is ultimately unreal, and that your job is to get out of here as fast as possible and into the uh, infinite bliss and all that. Yeah. Whereas the more tantric wing of Hindu philosophy, which Kashmiri Shaivism really is, and uh, Aurobindo, you know, that had a lot to do with Mike's introduction to that whole subject, uh, takes the world, you know, the, the experience world as real. It's just that reality is much bigger than just that. Yeah. And a lot of these debates um, can be resolved by kind of looking at life as multi-layered and there's a dimension at which nothing ever happened and there's a dimension at which all kinds of stuff is happening but it's perfect just as it is and there's a dimension at which a lot of things are happening and they're not perfect and they need to be improved and you know Mm -hmm. all those things can be simultaneously true yeah yeah this is where the whole subject gets puzzling (laughs) Um, and, you know, I mean, there's a good example, I mean, a good corollary with just what physics tells us. I mean, it seems like an object like this pen is really solid, and then there's a level at which, you know, it's it's just molecules and there's no evidence of anything pen-like, and then there's an atomic level at which there's no evidence of anything molecular and, and so on and so forth. So. You, you can't say that just because subatomic particles or you know quarks and electrons are the ultimate reality that the pen doesn't exist. In a mm-hmm. sense, it doesn't, but in a, at least in an apparent sense, it does. Yeah. There's another related question well related to Curtis's question, um, which a, f- a mutual friend of Curtis and mine often poses, Tom Christofiak, who's been on Bat Gap, and that is he he often argues that well let's say you're meditating you have an experience of unboundedness and you know you feel you you've gotten down to the real nitty-gritty of creation and how do you know that how do you know that consciousness really is unbounded and you know extends you know infinitely and is not confined by your you know six foot frame um or you're just having an experience in which it really feels like it's that, but that's just sort of a being created mm-hmm. by your your brain, and yeah. it has nothing to do with what consciousness actually is. Yeah, um, 
Yeah, this gets back to the uh, treatment of mystical experience by contemporary science, which is mostly to ignore it. But uh, among the very few who paid any attention to it, the overwhelming tendency has been to devalue and pathologize it on grounds that it's just some aberrant brain activity. And that's all that's going on. Uh, James, you know, in, in uh, uh, varieties of religious experience, again, kind of set the temper for most people's response to it, which is to say that these experiences are typically totally compelling and convincing for those who have them, uh, but they're not sufficient to compel the rest of us to accept the, their view of things. Now, I think James actually understated uh, the possibilities here for uh, scientifically justifying the underlying metaphysics. For example, uh, in that audience, he was not so willing to uh, talk about the relationship between mystical experience and psi phenomena. I mean, if your mystical experience tells you that something uh, happened yesterday in a remote location and that turns out to be true, that's a, a piece of evidence that supports the uh, reality and the evidential importance of your mystical experience. Similarly, a lot of the uh, great geniuses of world intellectual traditions have also had mystical experiences that have opened them up in some way. These are, these are uh, you know, empirical kinds of findings that support the reality of the experiences. And I think uh, that connection remains to be developed much more fully uh, by scientists and historians and scholars of religion. Uh, so, yeah, you certainly have to be careful constantly uh, and not presume that, you know, that little voice in your head is uh, actually, uh, you know, the, the ultimate uh, preparing you to save suffering humanity from its struggles. And, I mean, if you look, there's quite a big literature of uh, the sort of uh, prophetic type mediumship, you know, or uh, I don't know what to call it even, but um, people who have been opened up to teachings about different departments of reality, like Course in Miracles, case in point, modern one, but there's stuff of this sort going way back, a couple of centuries even. Uh, and as you can imagine, it it certainly would be very seductive to be told that you are to be the vehicle for you know, communicating these great teachings to the suffering world. Uh, and if that sort of thing happens, I think you have to be extremely careful about it. I mean, we have to be careful all the time about taking experiences at face value. Uh, I mean, the same is true in the whole world of parapsychology and psychical stuff. I, as interesting as it is, it's, it's, it's got a, uh, about as uh, high a ratio of noise to signal as things like uh, diet and uh, politics, let's say. So it, it behooves everyone who gets involved with it to just be very careful and yeah. disciplined. This point about being the vehicle, there's a nice quote from your book, um, which to me implies that in a sense we're all the vehicles, but it, or all of us are vehicles. If, if the entire universe presses to manifest its latent divinity, then we must share that impetus, which is evident in our desire for the illuminations, self-existent delight, self-surpassing love, and sense of eternal freedom and identity we experience in our highest moments. And I think this was this quote was uh, um, kind of a collaboration on evolutionary, evolutionary panentheism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That there's just this sort of divine impulse or trajectory to, you know, which I, which I regard as, as the sort of ultimate driving force between the creation of the universe, you know, as Brian swim famously said, you know, you leave hydrogen alone for 13.7 billion years and you end up with rose bushes giraffes and opera there's, <laughs> there's just this kind of evolutionary momentum or trajectory or tendency or impulse which has given rise to greater and greater complexity to the point where 
you know, beings such as we exist and probably much beings much greater than we who can discuss these things and not only discuss them, but turn around and experience that field of intelligence from which all this has arisen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, uh, what you quoted was from Mike Murphy's final chapter in beyond physicalism, ah. uh, where he portrays, uh, evolutionary panentheism as a what he calls a stealth worldview uh, that it's been around for a long time i mean it comes out of uh, the uh, southeast asian philosophical traditions it was present in uh, uh, neoplatonism in uh, ficino and company in the early renaissance in the german idealists of the 18th and 19th century so it, it keeps resurfacing. It's never, well, it, it, it's been suppressed again in the modern era with the rise of physicalism, but that's not because anybody ever proved that this was an incorrect view of things. It's just that physicalism seems so successful. I mean, and, and it produced lots of goodies for human use. And a lot of people mistake those goodies for evidence of the correctness of the philosophy. Uh, that's where the big mistake crept in. I mean, you know, people like Russell and Moore, who claim to have refuted idealism, basically said, hey, we don't need this. Look what else we got that works so well. It was pretty much the sum and substance of their arguments. But I think we are at the point now where this kind of a picture is surfacing again and very importantly, it's not surfacing purely from the religious and philosophical side, but from the scientific side as well. And I think that may be the decisive kind of added ingredient that allows it to finally uh, get the kind of respect that it deserves as a much better picture of the ultimate nature of things. Yeah, I've never been a formal student of the history or philosophy of science, but as I understand it, you know, I mean, when, prior to the advent of, of the scientific method, there were a lot of weird ideas floating about, many of them enforced even with the death penalty by, by mm. the church. And uh, science was a welcome um, corrective of that situation in, in which we, you know, could insist upon empirical evidence and, and um, you know, collective um what do, you, what do you call it? Just um, confirmation of evidence found. So it wasn't just one person's subjective, you know, arbitrary, uh, anecdotal experience. And um, and but that somehow or other we've ended up. It seems to me not we, but the general assumption in the world that um, science is the be and all and end all. It doesn't get any better than that. You know, if it if it doesn't fit into the model of science, then it's not worthy of consideration. But, you know, maybe it can get better than that. Or maybe science can itself can evolve to be a bigger basket. And specifically with the kind of things we're talking about, um, mm -hmm. you know, can these realities, which apparently can only be explored through, you know, deep subjective experience, um, fit within the realm of scientific investigation or is subjective experience just too variable and you know because we all have different nervous systems and we might all be practicing different techniques and all and you know i suppose this has been a problem even with psychology um maybe that's why bf skinner held sway for a yeah. while with behaviorism but you know we're talking about realities that can't be measured with a, a physical instrument necessarily it, you can you can measure the um correlates of them by EEG or whatever, but you can't really measure what the person is experiencing. But that doesn't mean that their experience is unreal or mm -hmm. less important or anything. So I don't know, to sum it up, you know, to what extent do you think that the mystical realm, if we want to call it that, can be amenable to the scientific method? Yeah, no, I think we can uh, do a lot better in terms of scientific study of mysticism. You know, psychology has always uh, existed in this sort of no man's land between the humanities and uh, hard science. I mean, if you go back to the beginnings of behaviorism, William James was 
his body was practically still warm when James B. Watson published his Behaviorist Manifesto. If you go back and read that thing today, it's astonishing that it had the impact that it had. I mean, that became the, the uh, reigning dogma for the next 50 years in American psychology, certainly experimental psychology. I mean, I can remember I uh, sat in on a class taught by Noam Chomsky in 1964 or five over at MIT on Cartesian linguistics. And somehow in the course of that, I mean, there were about 200 people in the room of whom maybe six were taking, <laughs> taking the course for credit. The rest of us were just there to sit at Chomsky's feet. The guy is absolutely unreal. Anyway, somebody asked this question about behaviorism and he uh, got real quiet for a moment and he said, in my opinion, the first 50 years of American experimental psychology will go down as a footnote in the history of science. I and mean, we're talking about the activity of thousands of people over decades, but he was right. I mean, that's basically what's happened since then. And it's shocking because the whole point of behaviorism was to make consciousness unsuitable as a subject for polite scientific conversation even. But, and there's also a big movement now, I, I should say, uh, stimulated really by the advent of these neuroimaging techniques to improve our methods for uh, describing and maybe quantifying or characterizing uh, subjective experience. And I think we are gradually learning how to do those things better. Uh, I'm not going to speculate as to anything about ultimate limits, but I, I do believe we can do way better than we have so far in terms of scientific approaches to things like mystical and psychedelic experiences. And to correlate those, you see, with what's going on physiologically. I mean, contrary to what you might uh, think from what you see in the popular literature, you know, uh, pictures of brains with little colored spots in them and all that sort of thing, we are at a point now where the, the imaging community is really straining to understand what's important about neural activity in relationship to mental activity and how to measure that. There, there's enormous amount of work going on at the frontiers of these disciplines. In my area, for example, EEG research, you might be recording 128 channels of EEG, producing enormous amounts of data, but what do you do with that data? What do you measure in it that you expect to correlate meaningfully with the, the subjective mental experience side of things? We're just beginning to learn how to do that stuff well. So there's a, there's a big, we're on a steep part of a, what's gonna be a long learning curve, but I think a lot more can be done along those lines. If you could conjecture where scientific uh, enterprise might be at 100 years from now or 200 years from now, you know, taking into account both, you know, the material measurable things and mystical or spiritual experiences. Do you think there will be a merging such that it's just one body of knowledge with different tools or facets to it? Or do you think there'll always be some kind of, what's the word, schism um, between the two? Well, I, I believe we can already glimpse in outline, a improved science-based worldview that accommodates spiritual realities in a meaningful way, and moreover, makes them accessible both individually and culturally. Um, I mean, I, I can't do better than hope that something of that sort emerges because uh, like I said before, I think we don't have much time to get this right or we're going to destroy ourselves and everything else. Okay, good. Um, <coughs> this question that came in from uh, Ivan Dimitrov is, <clears throat> he wants to know, um, double slit experiments confirm consciousness affects material reality. Do you incorporate quantum mechanics in your studies of consciousness? Uh, the guy who's done most with that is uh, Dean Radin. Mm -hmm. who's uh, done and published a bunch of experiments. Um, He's been on BatGap twice. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the other person that I've, I've been closest to is uh, Henry Stapp, 
who is a quantum theorist, inventor of S matrix theory and stuff like that, uh, who is very much on board with the kind of picture that I described as emerging at the end of beyond physicalism. Um, you know, he's advanced a, a picture of the mind brain interaction, which he thinks uh, reconciles a kind of dualistic point of view with quantum mechanics. <clears throat> he's also very sympathetic privately to the idea of a, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the realm of quantum potentials, potentiae, uh, being thought of as a kind of, he thinks it's more mental than physical in the traditional sense, and is very comfortable privately with the idea of a big mind at the basis of all that happens, including, you know, both, well, our experience, both of ourselves as separate individuals and also our shared experiences of a surrounding natural world. I mean, it has to be accounted for somehow, right? The, uh, yeah, let me uh, just go on with this for a moment. Um, the big obstacle, certainly for me, and I think for a lot of people, to moving toward idealism is an argument you often get from physicalists even open-minded physicalists who are willing to acknowledge that they are having trouble explaining consciousness. They say, but look, you guys have exactly the opposite problem. You have to explain matter from consciousness. <coughs> what I would like to uh, propose to you is that that's not quite right. There's an asymmetry in the explanatory challenges to the physicalist and the idealist, because what the idealist has to explain is not matter as classically conceived. That's part of the conceptual system that we elaborated over several centuries to explain a lot of things, which it does very well. It's just that now we're encountering some things that it seems unable to explain. So what the idealist has to explain is not parts of the, that conceptual apparatus that we have previously tried to use to explain consciousness and so on, but to explain those regularities of experience for which we invented that apparatus. I'm not sure I said that very well. And that's exactly what people like uh, Federico Fagin and Bernardo Castrop are attempting to do, uh, to basically understand how it could be that out of a cosmic consciousness comes both us as individuals and the mostly pretty much the same kind of worlds that we experience when we're together. So stay tuned for that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I always, um, you were talking about, Vedanta recent uh, a little while ago and how it seems to have an up and out orientation like mm -hmm. you know let's get out of here as quickly as possible um, <laughs> whereas Kashmir Shaivism you know kind of honors the uh, material world more um, in fact here's a quote from your book I believe somebody named Lorelei Bernanke uh -huh. um, yeah. Avina Gupta and his non-dual Kashmir Shaivism similar right. to Advaita Vedanta but which takes a tantric or panthe panentheistic turn that more explicitly embraces the everyday world as fully real and the cities as an important part of that world not to be belittled mm -hmm. or ignored but um you know as I move through my life um I'm constantly I guess astonished you could say um by the intelligence uh, that must that is evident i think in every little thing um i mean i often use the example there's actually a name for this but um if you took um if, if you took all the atoms in a gram of hydrogen and enlarged them to the size of unpopped popcorn kernels they'd bury the continental united states nine miles deep <laughs> and <laughs> and uh you know that's just one gram of hydrogen and you know we have this whole huge thing and you know. and when you consider what that the implications is that every single one of those little atoms is this marvel of you know functioning that we don't even fully understand but it abides by 
or certain laws of nature and it, it displays orderliness and mm -hmm. it, and and so on and so forth so you know i think the kashmir shaivist shaivist perspective would be that you know we are swimming in an ocean of intelligence which mm -hmm. thoroughly pervades us we we and that ocean are one and that it's it's sort of too simplistic to write it off as just consciousness plain vanilla consciousness but without bringing in the intelligence factor oh yeah uh, which you know you can equate with god if you want to um but that that's the kind, that's the stuff that really fascinates me mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh you know in the uh, indian tradition they celebrate the idea of the jivan mukta you know a person who is liberated in this life and a, an effective agent mm -hmm. for improving things and certainly i mean in the catholic tradition you know some of the great saints mystics saint Teresa and john of the cross people like that ignatius were engines of getting things done in this world and uh, you know maybe if we had a bunch more such people we could uh, start rapidly making improvements in our overall civilization and state of things i'm all yeah. for it um let me look at some of these questions that dana sawyer sent in hello great, dana yeah he's probably not watching right now but he'll watch this later all he's right. been on bat gap a couple of times old friend of mine um mm -hmm. we've covered some of these um filter theory we've talked about and uh Let's see, near-death experiences we talked about. Ian Stevenson, past lives. Uh, okay, this is a good one. Uh, as you know, um, yeah. Oh, sorry. C Carl Jung, um, Abraham Maslow, and Stan Groff have all argued that much of the anxiety, neurosis, and depression in our society are directly caused by a frustrated desire to self-actualize rather than only being due to repressed memories, fears, and desires. Um, so in other words, we're all frustrated because we have mm -hmm. this incredible latent potential and we're not able to realize it or express it. Now, what are your thoughts in that regard? Oh, I, you know, I, I think that's uh, the right way to think about it. I mean, one of, the, uh, one of the great advantages of the kind of psychological picture that I sketched before the Myers-James view is that it clearly implies that we can gain access to these higher potentials by putting ourselves in suitable states and there's every reason to believe that we know how to do research of kinds that will let us get better at understanding what those conditions are and you know eliciting them or stabilizing them in people who want to achieve you know release those potentials so there's there's an enormous applied uh, aspect to this emerging picture uh one that i think can be really helpful at many levels going forward i don't expect to do much of it myself i'm right near the end of my career but i the door is open now to that kind of work yeah this relates to the notion that you know they say we use such a small percentage of our full potential and you know we're yeah. always blaming <clears throat> external circumstances or people uh, for the shortcomings of life you know all oh, this politician and that you know that person there and and all but um you know if it's true that we're only using a fraction of our our full potential then of course the world is going to be full of problems and difficulties yeah, yeah. and and all and um you know, if if the understanding that we have tremendous inner, inner potential um, could be more commonplace, and if if methods for un developing it or unfolding it could be more commonplace, we would automatically see huge, profound, yeah. fundamental changes in the world. Yeah, of course, that's been the driving impulse of Mike Murphy and Esalen Institute for sixty years or whatever it is. Yeah. Well, what you were saying earlier about things seem to be heating up you know younger people yeah. and this person here, here and there all kinds of people there and the psychedelic renaissance and there it's so, so many different fronts um yeah. you know perhaps it gives us reason to be optimistic 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I do feel very optimistic about the long-term possibilities here if we can <laughs> keep ourselves going long enough to uh, realize them. And if I may, let me just insert a kind of a self-serving observation here. Um, we urgently need to find a replacement for me as head of our neuroimaging laboratory. This is my other hat. I mean, I sort of bracket the main line of Dobson's work on two sides, one being this theory stuff that I got pressed into willy-nilly through Esalen. But uh, my other main duty is to run this lab, and we've been very shorthanded. Uh, it's a great facility. We need you know, somebody who shares our kind of views of things and has the relevant capabilities to take over. So anybody out there who hears me say this and wants to inquire about it, uh, go look on our website. First of all, just DOPS, Google DOPS UVA. You'll go right there. And I'll click, the, I'll link to it from your BatGap page also. Okay, thank you. And there's a um, there's a elaborate description of the, the lab itself, the uh, research program, the history, and so on, of, and rationale for what we're trying to do. So uh, anybody out there who uh, thinks he or she is uh, up for that, please contact me. Great. Um, do you have like, uh, you, you said you're near the end of your career. Um, are you, wh what kinds of things are you still working on and would you like to accomplish still? Well, I'd like to uh, carry forward this theory project in the way I was talking about it with regard to Tim Eastman. Uh, because that would combine the sort of uh, extreme technical rigor and sophistication of his approach with the more psychological uh, characteristics of ours. And I sense, although I can't yet articulate, that there are good ways of building bridges between our two approaches. So that's one thing. That's on the theory side. Then on the experimental side, I've long wanted to uh, uh, bring a guy out of retirement who was, well, this is a person I met very early in my parapsychology career, about, about the first month after I arrived at the Rhine Lab, this guy showed up who could do pretty much anything we asked him to do. And we published a bunch of papers uh, with him about him at that time. Uh, I'd like to bring him back uh, into the new lab because we can now do things we could only dream about doing in the old days. And it would be great to have him come back do a spectacular ESP performance and use our new EEG methods to predict success trial by trial in his performance on that task. That would be the sort of home run of my career, experimentally speaking. You have a chapter in your book um, entitled Patanjali's Yoga Sutras and the Siddhis, uh, mm -hmm. which you co-wrote with Ian Witcher. Um, yeah. I met Ian at the SAND conference, and we sat on the plane next to each other coming home from the conference. Um, so um, what's how does that fit into this whole conversation we've been having and everything you've been doing? Yeah, uh, we portray um, Sankhya and yoga in that chapter as kind of steps toward Kashmir Shaivism, really, or a, a version of Vedanta that takes the actual as experienced as as real, uh, more real than uh, the uh, Ramakrishna Vedanta guys typically do. And there's a lot of debate about the degree of difference, really, between Vedanta as conceptualized by uh, Shankara and the later forms, the Kashmiri forms. And uh, I don't profess to be into that in any depth. Um, I think the differences are sometimes exaggerated by people who want to plug for Kashmiri Shaivism. But uh, in any case, that's the, uh, that's the role that that chapter played in, in uh, Beyond Physicalism, um, but we chose it particularly because of book three, you know, of the Yoga Sutras, which deals explicitly with cities and uh, tried to make connections between uh, Patanjali's treatment of the subject there and um, various kinds of extreme cities that occur in the context of Catholic mysticism. Um, I'm not sure how much the audience knows about this, but uh, you know the 
the making of saints in Catholicism is a really big deal. And uh, it was uh, put in a very kind of legalistic framework early on uh, by the guy who actually served as the uh, um, sort of devil's advocate in the proceedings for Joseph of Copertino. Joseph of Copertino was a 17th century Catholic saint who was observed levitating not just occasionally and to a little degree, but dramatically in broad daylight on hundreds of occasions by thousands of people, witnesses, including skeptical and hostile witnesses who could not deny that what happened happened, even if they might differ in small details about it. I mean, this guy would uh, sometimes go up 30 yards and stay there for minutes and stuff like that. It's, this is not subtle. You know, Michael Jordan, eat your heart out. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so uh, anyway, that, that guy was a, a buddy of Voltaire. I can't even think of his name at the moment, but, uh, and he was the one who codified the procedures for these deliberations, which are much like trials in the, uh, you know, modern secular sense. And they distinguished the, quality of witnesses and uh, and of course people were obliged to testify under oath which at that time in those circumstances was taken very seriously you lie about this stuff and you go you know straight to the nether world when you have the misfortune to die so it's a, it's a body of literature that i take quite seriously I mean, you can't deny this stuff without denying practically everything about human testimony yeah, a friend of mine named Craig Pearson, who's also been on Bad Cap, wrote a book about all the historical accounts of levitation that he mm -hmm. could find, you know, from around the world. And there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them. Yeah. And of course, you know, modern day skeptics would just say, well, you know, it's, it's just fairy tales. It's like, you know, the mm -hmm. um, kind of like older version of Marvel Comics or whatever. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but it would be really cool if if some if we had a Saint Joseph these days who, who oh, yeah. could do that kind of thing, because I mean, boy, talk about forcing people to change their paradigm. Um, mm -hmm. Physicists and others would have to really scramble to understand how in the heck such a thing could be, yeah. and you know, firstly, they'd have to prove that it wasn't some kind of David Copperfield mm -hmm. illusion. But once that was settled. If someone could be seen levitating 30 feet in the air or 30 yards, or whatever, and hovering up there, and there was no way it was fake, no wires, no strings, um, what does that mean about you know human consciousness? What does that mean about the law of gravity in relation to, to consciousness? Do do the physical laws that govern the universe reside in consciousness in some way, such mm -hmm. that if one could master consciousness adequately, one could command those laws or cause That's them to behave differently. And, you know, yeah. interesting. A couple of things. Uh, uh, my friend and colleague, Mike Grosso has written, well, he's got two books about uh, Joseph. One is called The Man Who Could Fly, and that's a summary of the evidence. Mm -hmm. And he finds related things in the uh, mediumistic literature and so on, and talks about all these issues about evidence and so on. Um, he's also uh, translated a uh, biography of Joseph that was written in the uh, early 18th century uh, by the son of uh, Bernini, the sculptor, with a long commentary about that. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, just last year sometime I discovered there's an article by a historian uh, of the early church and medieval church named Carlos Ayer at uh, Yale who totally independently of anything to do with psychical research wrote a paper called the good the bad and the airborne <laughs> which is specifically about Joseph and concludes that hey guys we got to face up to it he flew <laughs> Yeah, definitely worth reading. I mean, it's 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 uh, like Mike's book, but uh, in a more condensed form. It's so easy for people, you know, who are very busy and are, you know, focused in their cubbyhole of specialty mm -hmm. to just eh, not even going to spend the time yeah. to look at that. Couldn't be. And that's it. I've heard from Dean Radin very often. You know, he, he gets that. Well, yeah, what you're doing couldn't be true. So I'm not right. going to look at it. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, uh, just to reinforce that point, uh, 
uh, let's see, it was about 2018, I think, a colleague of ours, Edsel Cardenia, published a very good uh, paper in the American Psychologist, which is the flagship journal of the American Psychological Association, summarizing several major lines of parapsychology research and meta-analyses that had been done of those. And in the very next issue, <laughs> supposedly uh, not as a deliberate attempt to rebut, there was an article by two psychologists who tried to argue that psychic psi phenomena cannot occur because they violate the laws of nature. <laughs> but get this, two psychologists yeah. who pose as experts in what physics can allow and not even recognizing the fact that a number of very prominent physicists have taken the subject very seriously. That, that's kind of what we're up against. Yeah, I mean, to that, I would say airplanes can't exist because they yeah. violate laws of nature, at least as understood, you know, way back. Um, yeah. It just means we don't understand the laws of nature well enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Augustine, somewhere in the city of God, says something to the effect that um, miracles occur not in contradiction to nature, but in contradiction to what is known to us of nature. Yeah. I mean, if Jesus really walked on water, for instance, I don't think he violated laws of nature. He just utilized the yes. laws of nature in a different way than we ordinarily yeah. can. Yes. Yeah. Interesting fact about Joseph, by the way, uh, that ought to be a clue, is that these levitations occurred only in the context of a uh, sort of mystical ecstasy. Right. He could be ecstatic without going up in the air, but he couldn't go up in the air without being ecstatic. Yeah. And uh, Henry Stapp, a physicist, uh, well, this, this could get too uh, complicated, but Henry tried to assimilate Joseph initially to his sort of standard theory about how we move our arms and so on, which involved uh, how fast you can issue directives to invoke a thing called the quantum Zeno effect. And he, his, his initial idea was that maybe in these ecstatic states, you can just do this much faster than normal and do bigger effects. But he eventually gave up on that <laughs> approach. He wasn't saying that Cupertino flapped his arms real fast. No, no, fast no, 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 no. no. Something mentally, else. Uh, mentally wanting to go up yeah. in a much more intense kind of way. And that's what did it. I don't know if he even wanted to. I mean, I, don't, I haven't read his biography, yeah. but I know with um, St. Teresa of Avila, she also had levitation experiences. Mm -hmm. And she didn't want to, but she, you know, she'd get into these states where she would just, yeah. you know, and she, cause she didn't want to draw attention to herself or anything. Yeah. Yeah. Joseph was the same way. Yeah. A lot of them were spontaneous. And there's one funny one Mike talks about where, uh, 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 maybe it was the Pope or somebody who was being visited by, uh, some Spanish official who brought his beautiful wife and they were coming to meet Joseph. Uh, his superior and Joseph didn't want to do that, but the superior made him do it. And uh, so this, this woman is approaching him and he was very preoccupied with, you know, being careful about interacting with women and that sort of thing. So uh, as this woman approached, he's just suddenly let out one of his shrieks and flew over the top of this group <laughs> and landed on the other side and ran off. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> There are oh, several yeah. things of that sort. Yeah. In the Joseph collection. <laughs> so there's more in heaven and earth ratio than are dreamt of in your philosophy. There's exactly there's a lot going on in the world that um, you know, we don't collectively appreciate mm -hmm. yet. But hopefully, like like you say, if we don't do ourselves in, we will. I got an email from uh Dwayne Elgin the other day. I don't know if you know oh. Dwayne. Yeah. But um he, he, basically he sent a file uh of that the, some other guy had written with sort of all the dire circumstances that humanity faces any one of which could do us in and yet he listed at least a dozen of them and you know i thought oh the poor guy i mean if that's i mean yeah. all those things are true but if you don't get that there's a uh an awakening of consciousness taking place in the world then all hope is lost i mean you could easily yeah. be depressed and suicidal if you if you didn't see that oh, taking place gosh it's easy to get depressed these days for sure yeah <laughs> so all righty 
Yeah, well, thanks so much. Um, I could talk to you for another two hours, but I think we probably both need to use the bathroom. Um, but this has been this has been really good, and uh, I've I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've enjoyed preparing for it, and you know, keep up the good work and uh, stay in touch. And if there's, you know, you know, if any, if you feel like you know, a year or two from now, there's a whole collection of points that we didn't cover in this one mm -hmm. that you'd like to cover, we can do another one. Sure. And, you know, if you have further questions, just pass them on. Talk them out. I will. All right. So thank you. And thanks right, to thank those. You. Yeah. Thank, thanks to those who've been listening or watching. Mm -hmm. And um, as you know, this is an ongoing series. You might want to visit the website. There's an upcoming interviews page, which lists all the things we have yeah, scheduled. Sure. I went there this morning, actually, and saw that. Okay, good. And uh yeah, and a bunch of other things. Explore the menus. It, it exists as an audio podcast if you like to listen to podcasts and mm -hmm. a bunch of other things. When I can. Oh, yeah. And send me the instructions about where to send the gear. Oh, I will. Yeah. Yeah. All right, everybody. Thanks so much. And uh, see you for the next one. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.